Good morning, Vietnam. I don't know why I started this episode that way. I don't know why I'm calling it an episode. It's a chapter. Anyway, it's the Paris Commune by Peter Kapakin. Coming up next on 1-800-THE-HIT. 1-8... 1880, 100. 1... 1880, the classic Marxist hits. Anyway, let's do this. Section 2. How the Commune failed to realize its true aim and yet set that aim before the world. Ten years already separate us from the day when the people of Paris overthrew the traitor government which raised itself to power at the downfall of the empire. How is it that the oppressed masses of the civilized world are still irresistibly drawn toward the movement of 1871? Why is the idea represented by the Commune of Paris so attractive to the workers of every land, of every nationality? The answer is easy. Actually... The revolution of 1871 was above all a popular one. It was made by the people themselves. It sprang spontaneously from the midst of the mass. And it was among the great masses of the people that it found its defenders, its heroes, its martyrs. It is just because it was so thoroughly low in quotation marks, that the middle class can never forgive it, and at the same time its moving spirit was the idea of a social revolution, vague certainly, perhaps unconscious, but still the effort to obtain at, la at last, after the struggle of many centuries, true freedom, true equality for all men and women. And various genders. Anyway, it was the revolution of the lowest of the people marching forward to conquer their rights. Attempts have been and are made to change the sense of this revolution to represent it as a mere effort to regain the independence of Paris and thus to constitute a tiny state within France. But nothing can be more untrue. Paris did not seek to isolate herself from France any more than to conquer it by force of arms. She did not care to shut herself within her walls like a nun in a convent. She was not inspired by the narrow spirit of the cloister. I was going to make a, a joke about that sounding like a Pokemon. I'm pretty sure it is a Pokemon, but... And, and there is a joke there, but I, I don't... I I failed you. Anyway, just uh, thought you wanted a break from all the talking. Now it's been a whole what three minutes, so there's your break, and now it's over. If she claimed her independence, if she tried to hinder the interference of the central power in her affairs, it was because she saw in that independence a means of quietly elaborating the bases of future organization and bringing about within herself a social revolution, a revolution which would have completely transformed the whole system of production and exchange by basing them on justice, which would have completely modified human relations by putting them on a footing of equality, which would have formed our social morality anew by founding it upon equality and solidarity. Communal independence was then but a means for the people of Paris. The social revolution was their end. And this end might have been attained if the revolution of March 18th had been able to take its natural course, if the people of Paris had not been cut to pieces by the assassins from Versailles. To find a clear, precise idea, comprehensible to all the world, and summing up in a few words what was needed to accomplish the revolution. This was really the preoccupation of the people of Paris from the earliest days of their independence, but a great idea does not germinate in a day, however rapid the elaboration and propagation of ideas during periods of revolution. It always needs a certain time to develop, to spread throughout the masses, to translate itself 
into action, and this time the Commune of Paris failed. It failed mostly because, as we have before observed, socialism ten years ago was passing through a period of transition. The authoritative... what was that word that I just said? Uh, authoritative, not authoritative. Authoritator. Uh, we have fun here. The authori the authoritative, God, I don't know why that's so hard, and semi-religious communism of 1848 had no longer any hold over the practical, free-thinking minds of our own epoch. God, these, the writers from this century loved the word epoch. It's in the Communist Manifesto like 69,000 times. Um, the collectivism which attempted to yoke together the wage system and collective property was incomprehensible, unattractive, and bristling with difficulties in practical application. Free communism, anarchist communism, was only beginning to dawn upon the minds of the workers and scarcely ventured to provoke the attacks of the worshippers of a government. Minds were undecided. So socialists themselves having no knock that shit off socialist themselves having no definite end in view did not dare to lay hands upon private property they deluded themselves with the argument which has lulled the activities of many an age let us make sure let us let us first make sure of victory and then see what can be done great idea how'd that work out for you that was me, not not Peter Kropotkin. Although that would be amazing if more socialist literature just had a sort of snarky tone to it. Although now now that I'm saying that out loud, I feel like that's like our socialism. But um, I've actually I never I don't I don't go on there. I don't actually know what it's like. I was just uh, going for the easy joke what else or tell basically any site where anyone says any thing anyway getting back into this make sure of victory as if there were any way of forming a free commune without laying hands upon property he says with exclamation marks as if there were any way of conquering the foe while the great mass of the people is not directly invest, uh, interested sorry, in the triumph of the revolution by seeing that it will bring material, moral, and intellectual well-being to everybody. The same thing happened with regard to the principle of government. By proclaiming the Free Commune, the people of Paris proclaimed an essential anarchist principle, which was the breakdown of the state. To the state, drop the state. Top, top notch comedy. Enter laugh track. Laugh track. All right. Exactly the place for levity. Two hundred old books on a website. Just uh, white and black. I am veering wildly off course, but uh, this one's gonna be like real short, so I'm okay with it. I need to pat it out artificially a little bit, so that's what you're listening to right now. But I should also probably get back to it. And so the start of the next paragraph is, and yet if we admit that a central government to regulate the relations of communes between themselves is quite needless, why should we admit its necessity to regulate the mutual relations of the groups which make up each commune? And if we leave the business of coming to a common understanding with regard to enterprises which concern several cities at once to the free initiative of the communes concerned, why refuse this same free initiative to the groups composing a single commune? There is no more reason for a government inside the commune than for a government outside. But in 1871, although not 
entirely sure if I agree with that last sentence, or, I mean, any of this. This is, I mean, I'm reading it so you can hear it for yourselves and, and make up your own minds. Uh, I may or may not believe what I'm reading, but, uh, yeah, all right, disclaimer. Uh, but in 1871, the people of Paris, who have overthrown so many governments, were only making their first attempt to revolt against the governmental system itself. Consequently, they let themselves be carried away by the fetish worship of governments and set up one of their own. The result is a matter of history. Paris sent her devoted sons to the town hall. There, shelved in the midst of files of old papers, obliged to rule when their instincts prompted, uh, prompted them to be and to act among the people, obliged to discuss when it was needful to act, to compromise when no compromise was the best policy, and finally losing the inspiration which only comes from continual contact with the masses, they saw themselves reduced to impotence. Being paralyzed by their separation from the people, the revolutionary center of light and heat, they themselves paralyzed the popular initiative. The Commune of Paris, the child of a period of transition born beneath the Prussian guns, was doomed to perish. But, by its eminently popular character, it began a new series of revolutions. By its ideas, it was the forerunner of the social revolution. Its lesson has been learned, and when France once more bristles with communes in revolt, the people are not likely to give themselves a government and expect that government to initiate revolutionary measures. When they have rid themselves of the parasites who devour them, they will take possession of all social wealth to share according to the principles of anarchist communism. And when they have entirely abolished property government and the state, they will form themselves freely according to the necessities indicated by life itself. Breaking it chains it doesn't say it's chains, it just says breaking it chains. Marxistfr.org. Not always the 100% most reliable when it comes to uh, typos, but it's all the same. Breaking it chains, overthrowing it idols. Humanity will march onward to a better future, knowing neither masters nor slaves, keeping its veneration for the noble martyrs who brought... Uh, Sorry, who bought with their blood and suffering those first attempts at emancipation which have enlightened our march toward the conquest of liberty and bread. Conquest of bread. Because he... That was, a, that was a book that he wrote. Anyway, that's the end of part two. And now it's part three of the Paris Commune by Peter Kropotkin. Subtitle, The Teachings of the Commune in Modern Socialism. And by subtitle, I mean just title. Regular title. Let's go. The public meetings organized on March 18th in almost every town where there is a socialist group are well worthy of careful attention, not merely because they are a demonstration of the army of labor, but also because they afford an opportunity for gauging the sentiments of the socialists of both worlds. They are a better opportunity for quote-unquote taking a poll than could be given by any system of voting, an occasion when aspirations may be formulated uninfluenced by electoral party tactics. The workers do not meet simply to praise the heroism of the Parisian proletariat or to call for vengeance, of the, uh, vengeance for the May massacres, while refreshing themselves with the memory of the brave struggle in Paris, they have gone further and discussed what lessons for the coming revolution must be drawn from the Commune of 1871. They ask 
what the mistakes of the commune were, not for the sake of criticizing the men who made them, but to bring out clearly how the prejudices about property and authority, which then reigned among workers' organizations, hindered the bursting forth of the revolutionary idea and its subsequent developments into a beacon to light the world. Like a blunt. Ayo. The lesson of 1871 has benefited the workers of every land, enabling them to break with their old prejudices and come to a clearer and simpler understanding as to what their revolution is to be. The next rising of communes will not be uh, merely a communal movement. Those who still think that independent, local, self-governing bodies must be first established and that these must try to make economic reforms within their own localities are being carried along by the further development of the popular spirit, at least in France. The communes of the next revolution will proclaim and establish their independence by direct socialist revolutionary action, abolishing private property. When the revolutionary situation ripens, which may not, which may happen any day, and governments are swept away by the people, when the middle class camp, which only exists by state protection, is thus thrown into disorder, the insurgent people will not wait until some new government decrees in its marvelous wisdom a few economic reforms. They will not wait to expropriate the holders of social capital by a decree which necessarily would remain a dead letter if not accomplished in fact by the workers themselves. They will take possession on the spot and establish their rights by utilizing it without delay. They will organize themselves in the workshops to continue the work, but what they will produce will be what is wanted by the masses, not what gives the highest profit to employers. They will exchange their hovels for healthy dwellings in the houses of the rich. They will organize themselves to turn to immediate use the wealth stored up in the towns. They will take possession of it as if it had never been stolen from them by the middle class. And when the industrial baron who has been levying blackmail upon the worker is once evicted, production will continue, throwing off the trammels which impede it, putting an end to the speculations which kill and the confusion which disorganizes it, transforming itself according to the necessities of the movement under the impulsion given to it by free labor. This is in quotes. Men never worked in France as they did in 1793, after the soil was snatched from the hands of the nobles, says the historian Michelet. Michelet? Michelet? Michelet. Doesn't really matter. And, um... I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna look it up. It does not matter how you pronounce that. Uh, I've never heard that person's name. Should I maybe? I don't know. Is this an unnecessary tangent that I'm going on? Yep. It's uh, ADD for you. Uh, anyway, I'm just gonna keep pausing. Maybe skip 15 minutes ahead. Just kidding, I'm going to get back to it. Never have men worked as they will on the day when labor becomes free and everything accomplished by the worker will be a source of well-being to the whole commune. An attempt has been made of late to establish a distinction between various sorts of social wealth and the socialist party is divided upon the question. The present collectivist school substituting a sort of dogmatic theory of collectivism for the collectivism of the old international, which was merely anti-authoritarian communism, has sought to establish a distinction between capital used for production and wealth supplying the necessities of life, machinery, 
factories, raw material, means of communication, and the soil are on the one side, and dwellings, manufactured produce, clothing, commodities on the other. The first are to be collective property, the second are designed by the professors of this school of socialism to remain private property. There has been an attempt to set up this distinction, but popular good sense has got the better of it. It has found it illusory and is impossible to establish. It is vicious in theory and fails in practical life. The workers understand that the house which shelters us, the coal and gas we burn, the fuel consumed by the human machine to sustain life, the clothing necessary for existence, the book we read for instruction, the lists that we put in our literature, repeating basically the same thing. I'm not done. Even the enjoyments we get are all so many component parts of our existence as, uh, are all as necessary to successful production and the progressive development of humanity as machines, manufactories, raw materials, and other means of working. The workers are arriving at the conclusion that to maintain private property for this sort of wealth would be to maintain inequality, oppression, exploitation, to paralyze beforehand the results of the partial expropriation. Leaping over the fence set up in their path by theoretical collectivism, they are marching straight for the simplest and most practical form of anti-authoritarian communism. Now, in their meetings, the revolutionary workers are... I said it, I said that the wrong, the wrong way. It's now in their meetings, not like now in their... There's no comma. So... Let's flip that back. Now in their meetings, the revolutionary workers are distinctly stating their right to all social wealth and the necessity of abolishing private property in articles of consumption as well as the, uh, in those of reproduction. That's how you pronounce it, right? Reproduction. On the day of the revolution, we shall seize upon all wealth stored up in the towns and put in in common, say the speakers. And the audiences confirm the statements with their unanimous approval. Uh, let us take each, uh, let's, uh, let, let each take from the pile what he needs and be sure that in the warehouses of our towns there will be enough food to Feed everyone until free production has made a fair start. In the shops of our towns, there are enough clothes to dress everyone, kept there in reserve while outside there is nakedness and poverty. There are even enough luxuries for each to choose among them according to his liking. Uh, I lost the accent there at the end, but that's probably a good thing. Uh... I find a tangent, but this one is actually useful. I find a um, more entertaining and um, more uh, relevant to imagine all of these things happening in um, our society, like right now. And I'm like, yeah, we're gonna raid the Forever 21. <laughs> That's just what was coming uh, to my head during that, but, uh, I think it, I think it, uh, it helps to think of, okay, what would this look like now, and not even bother with what it looked like then, because it doesn't really matter, unless it's a specific thing to guide us, like, just apply it to your life now, and what I just said might be completely obvious to some of you and to others of you you may just not have thought about it that way and either is, is fine so uh let's let's continue with this um i was 
Judging by what is said at commune commemoration meetings in France and elsewhere, the workers have made up their minds that the coming revolution will introduce anarchist communism and the free, reorgani free reorganization of production. These two points seem settled, and in these respects, the communes of the next revolution will not repeat the errors of their forerunners, who so generously shed their blood to clear the path for future progress. There is, however, a third and no less important point upon which agreement is not yet reached, though it is not so very far off. This is the question of government. As is well known, there are two sections of the Socialist Party completely divided by this point. On the very day of the revolution, says the one, we must constitute a government to take possession of the supreme power. A strong, powerful, resolute government will make the revolution by decreeing this and that, and forcing all to obey its commands, that is, way a straw man argument um even if it is accurate possibly still um and then the flip side of that is a miserable delusion says the other any central government taking upon itself to rule the nation i i'm sorry i was I was going for Goofy there, and I, I just, I can't, I can't, I can't do that for an entire section. Let's pick another, just generic accent. Ah, oh. a miserable delusion, says the other. Any central government taking upon itself, okay, I like this, I like this one better. To rule a nation must certainly be a mere hindrance to the revolution. It cannot fail to be made up of the most incongruous elements, and its very essence as a government is conservatism. It would do nothing but hold back the revolution in communes ready to go ahead without being able to inspire backward communes with the breath of revolution. The same within a commune in revolt. Either the communal government will merely sanction accomplished facts and then it will be a useless and dangerous bit of machinery, or else it will wish to take the lead to make rules for what has yet to be freely worked out by the people themselves if it is to be really viable. It will apply theories where all society ought to work out fresh forms of common life without creative force which springs up in the social organism when it breaks its, uh, when it breaks its, its chains and sees new and larger horizons opening before it. The men in power will obstruct this outburst without doing any of the things they might themselves have done if they had remained among the people, working with them in the new organization, instead of shutting themselves up in ministerial offices and wearing themselves out in idle debates. The revolutionary government will be a hindrance and a danger, powerless for good, formidable for ill. Therefore... What is the use of having it? Well, you certainly gave one side a lot more time to talk than the other. Just saying, Kropotkin, calling you out, but whatever. This is your book, so you can say what you want. However natural and just, this argument still runs counter to a great many prejudices stored up and accredited by those who have had an interest in maintaining the religion of the government side by side with the religions of property and of theology. This prejudice, the last of the three, still exists and is a danger to the coming revolution, though it already shows uh, signs of decay. We will manage our business ourselves without waiting for the orders of a government. We will trample underfoot those who try to force us to accept them as priests, property owners, or rulers, the workers have begun to say, in unison. 
Apparently, we must hope that the Anarchist Party will continue to combat government worship vigorously and never allow itself to be dragged or enticed into a struggle for power. We must hope that in the years which remain to us before the revolution, the prejudice in favor of government may be so shaken that it will not be strong enough to draw off the people on a false route. The communes of the next revolution will not only break down the state and substitute free federation for parliamentary rule, parliamentary rule, I don't know why, words are hard, you guys have been talking for like two hours and 40 minutes straight. Um, they will part with parliamentary, whatever with that rule within the commune itself. They will trust the free organization of food supply and production to free groups of workers which will federate with like groups in other cities and villages, not through the medium of a communal parliament, but directly to accomplish their aim. They will be anarchist within the commune as they will be anarchist outside it, and only thus will they avoid the horrors of defeat, the furies of reaction. And uh, that's it. That's it for the Paris Commune.